Welcome to Foothill Christian Fellowship. Uh, please find yourself a, a seat. If you're outside, why are you outside? We're privileged to come and to worship our God together as the family of God. One thing that we worship God for this morning in the fundamentals of the faith class is God's eternality, or that he's the God who is everlasting, which reminds us we can trust him to carry out his plan and promises throughout creation because he's everlasting. He has all power and he's able to do it and he will. And we want to stand and to praise the everlasting God together. So let's do that this morning. Good morning. Our scripture reading today is 1 Peter chapter 4. We'll be reading verses 1 through 11. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lust of men, but for the will of God. For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desires of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lusts, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In all this, they are surprised that you do not run with them in the same excess of dissipation, and they malign you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For the gospel has for this purpose been preached even to those who are dead, that though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the spirit according to the will of God. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Join me as we pray. Father, we have just sung and recognized and, and praised you because you are the only true God and you are from everlasting to everlasting. You have no beginning, you have no end. You alone are almighty, you alone are all wise, you alone are all good. You alone are clothed in majesty. And we have also sung how you are our salvation. Salvation is from the Lord. And yes, we do live in a time that is prone to uncertainty. And yet you are the faithful God, the God who is marked by his covenant love, his trustworthiness, you accomplish all things according to the counsel of your own will. Even the evil things of men that are intended for evil, you take those and you turn them for good and you cause them to work together for good for those who love you, for those who are the called according to your purpose. And Father, today there are many who name your name who suffer today. Today there are many who will be persecuted and killed because they name the name of Christ, because they choose to reject the God of this world and have turned to the savior of their souls. And for those who suffer persecution today, Lord, we ask that you would strengthen them, that they, you would encourage them that their faith would not fail, that they would be valiant for truth, that they would not give way 
to the temptation of ease, to the temptation of, of turning aside, that they would be faithful unto death, that you may give them the crown of life. Father, we don't know what it is to be persecuted like that. We live in a time of uncertainty and boy, there's all kinds of stuff going on right now that, um, that just breeds divisiveness. And Lord, it, it's the desire of our enemy that that divisiveness would come here that it would divide the people of God. And Lord, we pray that we would not fall prey to that, that we would hold fast to sound doctrine, that we would hold fast to what you have declared to be true, that we would not give in to emotion or to passion or frankly to any other uh, draw but that we would be governed by what you have revealed to be true. And Lord, that we would be most concerned, first, foremost, and in everything, with honoring you and obeying you and following you and doing what you say to do, what you say to be right. There is a day coming, Lord, when you are going to judge the living and the dead and how grateful we are that on that day we will not face you as judge. We'll face you as our Father. But Lord, we do pray for those who stand in judgment now. They're at war with you. You are at war with them. You govern every breath that they take. And they are in imminent danger of facing your wrath, undiluted, unmitigated, and eternal. And so Father, I pray that you would help us to be diligent as your slaves, that we would be those who live for you, that we would be those who speak for you, that we would carry forth your gospel, that we would not just be in word, that we would live it as well that we would be examples of those who are children of the risen King. Lord, thank you that you've rescued us. Thank you that you don't leave us to our own devices now. You've given us your word in our language that we can read and understand. You've given us your spirit so that we can understand what it is that you've commanded. All these things are from you. We don't bring anything to the table for that. But Lord, help us to be faithful and diligent now that we would be fervent in our love for one another, that we would be fervent in our love for you, that we would be fervent in our service for you. Lord, help us. Pray for Charles now as he comes to bring your word that you would help him to cut it straight, that he would proclaim it, that we would understand that it's not his word, it's yours. And these are not divine suggestions. They are divine commands from our almighty King. And Lord, we bow before you today and recognize that you are the one true God. Help us to be humble. Help us to be quick to turn, quick to repent where we need to. And Father, help us never to forget the name that we bear, the one that's been given to us. Thank you. We worship you today in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to remain in 1 Peter chapter 4 this morning. So if you didn't close your Bible, we're staying there in 1 Peter 4. If you're not there, that's where we're going. And we're going back to 1 Peter chapter 4. By way of announcement, as the kids head off to their respective classes, now we have a, a harvest festival coming up on October. October 29th, so your kids can get some candy and then you can hide it from them when you get home and ration that out over time uh, and try to explain why a large amount of it's in the trash later. <laughs> How do they always find that? Anyways, 
Uh, also, uh, thank you for sending in some uh, deacon nominations to the office, uh, helping us elders and considering men that could help us in our ministry of uh, ministering to you and for caring for Jesus' sheep. I also wanted to make you men aware that the men's morning study is continuing and the next book that you're going into is a study of 1 Kings 1 through 11, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. You can sign up for that in the foyer. If you want to be a part of that, if you have any questions, you can contact the office, which is open Tuesday through Friday, 9 to 5. That's all the announcements. Yeah, one thing I wanted to mention was we had a church work day yesterday. It was real nice. We got a whole bunch of oak stacked up there. Had a real good time. One of our favorite things we do, to do together is uh, church work day. Uh, it was a, a taste and picture of the kingdom to come where we'll enjoy working for our Lord in his new creation. I love those things. I know you guys do too. I have to schedule another one. All right, as we return to 1 Peter chapter 4, uh, we're going to go from, from that paragraph and verses 1 through 6 to looking at that paragraph 7 through 11, and in this message, just be focused on verses 7, 8, and 9. I wanted to try to clarify a point from last week's message, particularly on the topic of suffering and persecution Peter, in that first paragraph in chapter 4, he writes about suffering in the flesh. So when, when we hear suffering in the flesh, we think of persecution, we think of being beaten, imprisoned, tortured, and things like that primarily. Now, suffering and persecution does involve that, but it doesn't only involve that. Peter, in that paragraph, I think, is broadening our understanding of persecution. So what, what does he have in mind when he's talking about suffering in the flesh? Well, you know what he had in mind by what he wrote. He said, you know, no longer living for human passions, but for the will of God, not living in sensuality and being maligned because you don't live to, ple to appease your senses like unbelievers do. That's what he's talking about when he's talking about suffering and persecution. The, the focus is more on the suffering being aimed at your thinking and your feeling more than your body. It's aimed at you being fearful, afraid, anxious, nervous, which is why Peter keeps saying things like, don't fear them, don't be intimidated, fear God only. The suffering persecution that he's talking about is more emotional manipulation than physical manipulation. The choice that we end up being faced with in our persecution and suffering is, well, who's going to be your fear and your comfort? Are you going to fear the world and look to their sensual comforts? Or are you going to fear God and be willing to suffer so that they might have the eternal comfort that you do in King Jesus? The enemy's persecution plan isn't always to harm you physically, but to make you comfortable so that you'll just stop talking about God's kingdom and proclaiming it and just enjoying the stuff of the world. You might remember how Satan tempted our own Lord with the kingdoms of the world and their glory, with the lust of the flesh the desires of the eyes and pride and status and possessions. The temptation was to have the crown without the cross, to have glory without suffering, to have comfort without difficult things like evangelistic conversations with people that make us uncomfortable, or to endure in one of those conversations where we just keep talking to people about the judgment of God until they say, what shall we do to be saved? Evangelism is a higher priority than escapism. And that's the temptation we're faced with, to just escape it all somehow rather than to evangelize. The message here 
isn't merely that suffering and persecution are coming. The message is that it's here. It's always been here uh, ever since Cain and Abel. You've been living in persecution for a long time. Some Christians were perplexed last year when some were saying, we're being persecuted by the government because they were saying, well, what do you, what do you mean we're being persecuted? They're just treating us like they're treating everybody else. I mean, nobody's beating us up or stealing stuff from us. I mean, how, how can you say that we're being persecuted when we're not specifically singled out and we're still pretty comfortable for the most part? Well, I want you to consider what the result is of persecution. Here's the result. You fear man. You fear what man might do to you. You fear man's disapproval. You fear man and how he might respond to you if you lovingly speak to him like Jesus did to Nicodemus in John 3.36, where he said, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God remains on him. That's how Jesus ended his conversation with Nicodemus. Who talks like that anymore? Jesus talks like that. And the world might call it hate speech, but that's speech from the God of love himself. Persecution opposes the truth. We've talked about this in the past. And the church is the pillar and the buttress of the truth. We uphold it. When truth is opposed, the church is opposed. The body and the head. They oppose Christ, who is the truth. They oppose God's creation mandate, going all the way back into Genesis. Everything that you read in Genesis that God says is good and establishes the foundation of society, when those things are opposed, that's persecution. When you have a society saying marriage isn't the foundation of our society, male and female, uh, you decide that for yourself. We will not have God's image here. Uh, they oppose children. Uh, they're an inconvenience rather than a blessing, they would tell us. They oppose working and being fruitful in our work. Uh, they, they oppose Everything that God has established as the foundation of creation, everything that he says is good. Well, how else have we seen the results of persecution in persecution against the truth? Well, some other recent examples was, would be fearing what Caesar might do to you if you fear God and obey his command to not forsake gathering together. Or you do meet but the persecution has put you in a place where you're actually afraid to confront what's happening. You're afraid to say in the light the things that are going on in the darkness. Persecution also happens by distorting the truth. Our persecutors have told us that love your neighbor means all sorts of things that forwards their will rather than God's will. But we know that part of the love your neighbor laws which God has written on the heart of every man is you shall not lie. Because lies harm people. And we love our neighbor when we expose lies. And lies not just in concerns to the gospel, but lies in concern to any just cause. Another example is some Christians have yet to return to Jesus' gathering because they were first fearful, but now they're just comfortable. Watching God's family meet from a distance through a screen they don't realize that they've been persecuted with fear and deceived with comfort. The reason that Christians don't realize that they're being persecuted today is because they're enjoying it. They're enjoying being silenced and not having those difficult conversations of warning people about the judgment to come. They enjoy not engaging life in the church and striving for holiness and the effort that that takes, a holiness without which none will see the Lord. They are enjoying the approval of man. Don't be pressured by the deceits of the world to fear man and seek a promise of comfort which they will fail to deliver on. Beware of pressure from unbelievers to live in sensuality and which Peter calls 
lawless idolatry. Or as John puts it in 1 John, do not love the world and little children keep yourselves from idols. What persecution does is it stops evangelism and it gives you something else to worship. We know that we are to love the lost, to tell them of God's coming judgment and not to cease lovingly preaching that to them just because they offer us an idol that appeases our flesh. We need to adjust our focus to not love the world, but rather to love God and to love our fellow Christian. And this is what Peter's focused on in 1 Peter 4 verses 7 through 11, which is the paragraph we're going to start looking at this morning. He's focused on how Christians are to pursue loving relationships with one another amidst suffering and persecution. So today's message is going to be on verses 7, 8, and 9, but I'm going to read 7 through 11 if you want to follow along in your copy of God's Word. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. 1 Peter 4, beginning in verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Our gracious Lord, these are your words. And I pray that I would preach only your words and the implication and application of your word and that you would strengthen us by your spirit to understand it and to live by it, that your name would be praised and that our being saved to live in you would be enjoyed. Amen. When there's only minutes left on the clock at the end of any sports game, you know every second counts. The coach's game plan is in laser focus. The players are undistracted. The end is at hand. So what do the players do? They do what they were trained to do. And it's at this point in 1 Peter that Coach Peter calls a timeout for his players and he reminds them of the game plan for the last days. Peter's game plan for the last days is simple. Love one another. Love your fellow Christian. How does the church thrive under evil government, crooked employers, perhaps having, having an unbelieving spouse while living in a world that says, just stop it with that Jesus judgment stuff. Let's just watch a movie and have a drink and forget about it. We need to be able to control ourselves when we're tempted to misplace our fear and seek comfort in the wrong places. We need to think about God's world according to God's word because he reigns over everything. And we need to be loving other Christians so that others will know that we're his disciples and they'll know that he actually came to the earth to save sinners. We need to be showing love to other Christians, not only the ones that we do know, but also the ones who are strangers to us. This is Peter's game plan in verses 7, 8, and 9. His first point being, be self-controlled and sober-minded. That's his first point in verse 7, be self-controlled and sober-minded. The second point, love one another. You see that in verse 8, love one another, and show hospitality. That's seen in verse 9. Show hospitality. Well, let's begin with his first point. Be self-controlled and 
sober-minded. Peter prefaces making this point with the words, the end of all things is at hand. We live in the last days right now. The last days did not begin in the year that shall not be named. It began when Jesus ascended into heaven. And the last days ends after his certain return. Jesus' return is imminent, it is definite, it is certain. Come, Lord Jesus. We need to understand today what Paul wrote in his last days on earth in 2 Timothy 3. Paul wrote to Timothy, whom he was discipling, in the last days there will come times of difficulty. Well, what difficulty are you talking about, Paul? For people will be lovers of self, he writes, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Paul just described your persecutors. They're lovers of self. They're lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. They claim to follow the true way of love while denying that God actually has the power to truly change somebody at all from the inside out. And our persecutors try to make us fear living differently than them. They try to make us fear confronting their sin and calling them to repentance. And they mean such, such persecution for evil, but God means it for good. And this is the good thing that he means it for, to test our faith, to purify it, to grow us in holiness. Well, with the end of all things at hand, as was true and when Peter's letter was written, it was much like our day. People were tested by absolutely everything. Everything was irritating. What the government was doing, what was going on with the economy, what was happening with their house, with their family, with other believers, everything was irritating to everybody except those who had their minds set on Jesus Christ. Our mind is to be on God's goal. God's goal in his creation is to restore his people and his land under his reign and rest forever for his own glory. And while all of creation is moving toward its goal of future glory, God is purifying your faith through all kinds of trials that it may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. God is making us holy. And he's reminding us of our certain hope. When Peter preaches eschatology, that's the study of last things, his two key words are hope and holiness. Eschatology isn't primarily focused on figuring out who the Antichrist is or what the mark of the beast is or creating this special group within the group at church that's absorbed in figuring out future events yet to be revealed. Eschatology is not merely concerned with the future, but it's also concerned with the present. It is concerned with the now. Eschatology is for now. Listen to how Peter makes this point in chapter 1, verse 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Eschatology is for hope today because we know what Jesus is going to do tomorrow. And listen how he continues in verse 14. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Eschatology is for holiness today. 
the holiness of worshiping God's majestic holiness, that there's none like him, but also worshiping God for his morality, which he calls us to live in and to image in the world. And we do that by beholding Christ. And as we behold Christ, we become holy like him. The application of eschatology in the scriptures is always hope and holiness in Jesus. It's not hope that people will see how smart and studied and well-read you are in eschatology, but it's, it's a hope that rejoices with other believers at the thought of the revelation of Jesus that is to come. It's not a holiness that's merely in talk, but it's a holiness that's seen in our relationships with other believers, in our marriages, in our parenting, in how we treat one another in the church. Peter's eschatology is very practical, and it recognizes that the goal of all things is at hand. That's what he means by the word end. The end of all things is at hand. The goal of all things is at hand. Therefore, today is for hope that God's going to make that goal. It's for holiness today because God is going to make you holy. You will be holy as he is holy. He will give you a body like Jesus's. One day, sin will be no more. But until that day, we draw near to that day. We draw near together that we could encourage one another in this hope and holiness. We draw near together, not further apart. And we aim to stir up one another in growth and maturity in Christ rather than avoiding one another. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us hope and be holy in it. What does this hope and holiness entail in our relationships with other Christians here sitting with us today? Peter writes, Therefore, be self-controlled and be sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Be self-controlled and sober-minded for the purpose of your prayers, so that you will give yourself to prayer. You're to be self-controlled in your emotions and your passions. You're not knocked out of balance by worldly temptations and pursuits and threats. Uh, You're sober-minded You're fixed on holy communion and prayer with God. You're not drunk on watching the world rebuild Babylon. You're soberly looking to the Lord who is building the new Jerusalem. You're being filled with the Holy Spirit, and you're growing in the knowledge of God's will from God's Word. You're living in the Spirit. You're thinking in the Spirit. You're praying in the Spirit. Self-controlled Sober-minded, spirit-filled people are a praying people. And this is a good reminder. It's easy to lose control and lose your mind when you observe the madness of this corrupt world. It's easy to get distracted with the fear of man and the desires of the, the flesh and to give in to escapism over evangelism. Spurgeon said it like this, Do not get intoxicated with anything, neither with pride nor with covetousness, nor with the cares of this world. Maintain your equilibrium. Stand steadfast and firm. Be sober-minded. We're to be about our king and his kingdom and the proclamation of his kingdom. It's judgment and it's salvation. We're to control ourselves and have our mindset on praying His kingdom come and His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's easy to get caught up in voicing our complaints to other men while neglecting to take them to God. Where do you go when you, fear, you feel fearful? Well, you should go to God because he's your refuge. Where do you go when you feel anxious? 
Well, you should go to God. He knows your needs even before you ask anything of Him. Don't let the vain and fleeting things of this passing world numb your prayer impulse. Remember some of the wisdom that's in the book of Ecclesiastes. All the wisdom in the world can't straighten out what God has made crooked. All the pleasure in the world that you can have will blow out of your life as quickly as it blew in. You have to go to the grave just like everybody else, wise as you might be or as foolish as you might be. Everybody goes to the grave. You can't manipulate what God has ordained to be so in the world any more than you can control if and when the sun goes up or down. You can observe all the oppressions that are done under the sun and congratulate the dead for having moved on past them. Even better if they had never been born. You can see the fool who won't work for a living. You can see the overworked who can't satisfy his covetous heart. Pleasure escapes them both. Death and judgment preach wisdom into the heart. And they pull things into focus very quickly for us and for others when we evangelize them and speak to them of death and judgment. Death reminds you that you're not in control. Judgment reminds you to fear God, that is to seek his kingdom, and to keep his commands, that is seek his righteousness. As self-controlled, sober-minded people, we are to be a praying people, not distracted with the vanities of the world that are but a breath. Now we know that prayer is how we put on God's armor, but you can't enjoy God's armor without prayer. And your fellow soldiers in the room right now are counting on your communications with our king. So what's a practical way that we can be praying for one another? Well, we talked about this at the family camp out. We had a message there Sunday morning. It was on Colossians chapter 1. If you can keep your spot in 1 Peter 4, you can turn over to Colossians 1. And there's a text there that I think gives us some ideas on how to pray for one another. Colossians chapter 1, we're going to go there and start in verse 3. Colossians chapter 1, verse 3. Here's some ideas on how to pray for one another. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints... Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel. We can pray for one another by being thankful to God for one another. Thank God for the faith that other believers have. Thank God for their faith being displayed in loving others within the church. Thank God for the common hope that you have in Jesus and how we remind one another of that. Well, that's some ideas on prayers of thanks, but what about our prayer request? Well, I think it's helpful to be reminded that we ought to spend more time putting our search inquiries into God rather than Google. God has better answers. You can waste a lot of time getting drunk on the intoxicating information of this world. But our confidence isn't in the things that we can learn on the internet. Our confidence is that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. So what sort of prayer requests should we have for one another? Look at... Colossians 1, starting in verse 9. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking 
that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. So what are our prayer requests for one another? Well, we pray to be filled with the knowledge of God. We need that to be able to honor God. Pray for wisdom for others. Wisdom to skillfully live by that knowledge that we find in his word. Pray for understanding that helps you to think through things in God's world according to God's word. So that we can live fruitful lives to his glory as we increase in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, to sum up those things, how do we pray for one another? We give thanks for faith, love, and hope. What sort of things do we pray for for one another? Knowledge, wisdom, understanding, so that God might be glorified through our lives. Clear-headed, Sober-minded communication with God is high priority amidst the persecution that we are in today. Now, we also have another priority, which is found back in 1 Peter chapter 4, in verse 8. The priority is love one another. So we're to be self-controlled and sober-minded praying people. And we're also to have the priority of loving one another. Loving our fellow believer. Peter writes in 3.8, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Peter goes from how to talk to God to how to talk to God's family here. This is made clear in his quotation of Proverbs 10.12. In fact, if you could, let's turn, we'll turn to Proverbs 10, 11. You can keep your finger there in 1 Peter 4, but turn to Proverbs 10, 11. There's a flow of thought that is continued there that I want you to see in its context. Proverbs 10, 11. I'll read 11 through 14. And I want you to notice how the focus is on the effect of your speech on others. Proverbs 10, 11. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. On the lips of him who has understanding, wisdom is found, but a rod is for the back of him who, like, who lacks sense. The wise lay up knowledge, but the mouth of a fool brings ruin near. Peter's point is made clearer by reading the Proverbs verse in its context. It's more clearly seen that what he's talking about is your speech. He's making the point, hateful speech stirs up strife, but loving speech seeks reconciliation with an offender. The idea that he's communicating isn't that love doesn't deal with offenses, but love seeks to win a reconciled relationship through speaking with one another. The word cover that you're reading in the text there is a synonym for forgiveness. Uh, sometimes you see these words side by side in the scripture. An example would be Psalm 85 verse 2. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. Well, what is forgiveness? What is this covering forgiveness that is being talked about? A simple definition for forgiveness is this. Forgiveness is a promise to pardon. Forgiveness is a promise to pardon. It, it sounds like this from Isaiah 43, 25. I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not Remember your sins. There's the promise that God makes. The promise to pardon. I will not remember your sins. But notice that it doesn't say that he passively just 
forgets about them, but he promises actively to not remember them, not to bring them up to himself or you or others, lest it be for your good. Well, how do we forgive one another the way that we've been forgiven in Christ Jesus? Well, first, forgiveness is an attitude. Forgiveness is an attitude that we, we want to extend forgiveness to others because we've been forgiven. Forgiveness is an attitude, but it's also an action. Forgiveness is an action. We actually seek to be reconciled to whoever it is that sinned against us. We seek their repentance because we want to be in reconciled relationship with them as we are in Christ. Peter writes, love covers a multitude of sins. That is, love covers, it seeks reconciliation, a multitude of sins. But how many times should I forgive my brother if he sins against me? Just seven times? What about 70 times seven? Or in other words, a multitude. As much as he sins against you, you be prepared to forgive him for all of those. How do you go about doing that? Well, it's by talking to him. It's by speaking to a brother about those sins that they may be covered and forgiven rather than ignored. Because to ignore them can only harm the relationship because the thing that is diseasing the relationship isn't being dealt with and left unattended. It won't be restored to health. Well, when you think about your own life, you know, hearing this text, what are you known for in your speech? What do people know you for and how you speak to them about things? How do other believers think about your speech toward them? Is your mouth a fountain of life and knowledge and wisdom and understanding, or does it conceal violence? Does it lack sense and bring ruin near? Perhaps it would be wise to consider Proverbs chapter 10 and to examine your heart under that text and see if there be any wayward way in you and to receive the Lord's kind correction there. Why would Peter address believers' speech and believers' relationship in his day in the setting that they lived in and being exiled because of government or uh, difficulties at work or in their marriage or within the body at church. Well, it's not, it's not hard to imagine. I tried to imagine what a conversation might be like back then and to imagine uh, the believer who stirs up strife and then the believer who tries to respond in love. Perhaps the believer stirring up strife might say something like, look at what Nero is doing. Don't you see what's happening? We've already lost so much and there's no reason to think that things are going to slow down anytime soon. We have to do something. Stop being so naive. Well, what about another believer responding in love? Well, they might say something like this. Friend, do you remember what Peter told us? They will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, that they might live in the spirit the way God does. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. You're right, we do have something to do. We need to be calling on God's name and not calling each other names. I'm willing to forgive the offense, and I'm, I'm eager to be praying together for the salvation of the lost, praying for our sanctification. What do you think? Well, Peter's not the only one who quotes this proverb and uses this logic. The same proverb and logic is used in the book of James, chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. You can listen to that. I'll read it to you. James writes, My brothers, if anyone among you wanders 
from the truth and someone brings them back, let them know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. You see, the, the covering isn't overlooking the sins, but it's recognizing that he's wandering and going after him. We don't overlook other people's sins. We don't ignore it. We don't avoid them because of it. But we seek to be reconciled to them because we want to display God's reconciling love in the church. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, get control of yourself. Get control of your feelings. Get control of your thinking so that you can pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. In other words, God, restore our fellowship with you as we restore our fellowship with others. It's not enough for us to just refrain from doing evil in our relationships to one another. We overcome evil with good, by doing good. Peter's game plan is not to go on the defense with other believers, but to go on the offense and to pursue a reconciled relationship. That's what love does. And speaking on the topic of love, I think we're helped to consider how Paul rebuked the Corinthians for lacking Christ-like love in 1 Corinthians 13. In 1 Corinthians 13, starting in verse 4, Paul writes, Love is patient. And kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Paul is teaching us that love is patient when it's wronged. It doesn't retaliate, but it shows kindness. Love is not jealous of others. It doesn't seek an opportunity to, to boast in one's own accomplishments. Love is not puffed up with a desire to be recognized or thanked by anyone. It does not seek its own preferences. Love does not get irritated with others. It doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Love isn't easily upset. It doesn't hold a grudge or stew over misunderstandings. Love does not excuse wrong attitudes or actions, but it hates what is false. And it loves to rejoice in what is true and praiseworthy. Love is forbearing, seeking to protect liberty of conscience. It assumes and believes the best about others. It is resistant to entertaining bad news from a bad heart about other believers. It shares in the blessing of gospel hope with those who have Christ as their inheritance. Love perseveres in the face of unpleasant circumstances. Love is Jesus' example of his relationships with others, which can be displayed through us. And Pastor Timothy Day taught on this concept of God's love as we finished our Sunday school class this morning and reminded us that how God loved is that he gave of himself despite our lack of loveliness or merit. So how do we honor God and some way image what his love is like? Well, we love others by giving ourselves to them despite their loveliness or having merited it or earned it from us. Love gives. As, first, as is written in 1 John chapter 4, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever has been born of God and 
And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. If you lack love toward other believers, you either don't know God and you need to repent and be born again into the family of the God who is love, or perhaps you are a believer and you just have a practical misunderstanding of the gospel. Maybe you understand the facts of Jesus being a satisfying sacrifice for your sins, but you don't know exactly how that applies to your relationship with other believers. The way that you display this misunderstanding of love that thinks it can only be given to those who earn it from you is often seen in how we just live with other people. You can know that you've been deceived in living out gospel love by how you display love to others. You only display love toward them when you think they've earned it from you. You think they have to speak your love language if you're going to show them any love in return. And I do mean to specifically allude to those love language books. They promote a selfish lie. It's not good marriage counsel. This concept of giving to get. Uh, scriptural love is just love gives, period. Not love gives in order to get something. When you live like that, your life preaches a false gospel of works-based salvation. Now, if we're honest and we're looking in the mirror and not just at others, all of us are inconsistent like this. All of us misrepresent gospel love at times in how we live. And that's why we need Jesus' kind of love. This is why we need Jesus' grace. As John wrote, and this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That means there's, there's forgiveness for those of us who have failed to show Christ-like love. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. By the grace of God, we can be forgiven. Our fellowship with God can be restored. Our fellowship with others can be restored. You can be changed. Uh, if you have a, a, a heart that's less than open and warm toward other believers, by the grace of God, you can change. You can't change anybody else, but you, by the grace of God, can change. And we want this. We want to have hearts that are as open and warm toward other believers as God's own heart is toward those who are part of his family with a love that gives, period. So may his love for his people be seen through us. And praise God that Jesus' love does indeed cover our sins. And in following Jesus' example of love, we seek to cover the sins of others, not in terms of paying for them as Christ did, because he's already paid for them. But in terms of imitating what Jesus' love is like, his love seeks, his love reconciles, his love is willing to pay a price. So here, here is Coach Peter's game plan for the last days. Be self-controlled and sober-minded. Love one another. And lastly, show hospitality. I see this in chapter 4, verse 9 in 1 Peter. The Greek word translated,
translated hospitality is a compound Greek word made up of the words love and stranger. The point being it's love of strangers. So Peter, in his thinking, has moved from our love for God being shown through being self-controlled and sober-minded to our love of other believers in pursuing reconciled relationship to loving believers who are strangers and helping them as they have need. Peter writes in 4.9, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Hospitality or showing mutual love toward believers who are strangers is not necessarily tied to having a nice home, cookies in the freezer, or fancy napkins. It might include that, and those things are nice. If you have those things, may God give you the power to enjoy them and to share them. I like nice houses, freezer cookies, and fancy napkins. <laughs> but it's not about the home, it's about the heart. Uh, you don't need to have any of those possessions to show love of strangers. Hospitality starts with a heart that wants to help other believers, other believers that you don't know, and to do this without grumbling. The Greek word there is gangusmu, which sounds like a grumbly word, doesn't it? Uh, it means behind the scenes talk. You have these strangers over and you walk into the kitchen yeah, like, if they weren't here, I'd have enough bacon to feed everybody. But they showed up. I'm going to run out of bacon. But you're missing seeing it correctly. It's not an inconvenience. It's an opportunity to serve Jesus. They're part of his body. So we do it with no low tones, no grumbles, mumbles, sighs, or complaints but with joy and excitement, kind of like Abraham and Sarah in Genesis 18 when they were hospitable to angels unaware. And Abraham said, Sarah, quick, calves, cakes. We've got company with a capital C. And in this case, it was even the pre-incarnate Christ himself, the angel or messenger of Yahweh, which they would realize later. Humble hospitality is giving help. And it's giving help with a sort of self-forgetfulness. You're not thinking about yourself. You're just so focused on them, you just forgot about you. And it also comes with a happiness to give just as freely as you received. And what, what do you have that you didn't receive? Humble hospitality speaks like this. It says, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And when did you come up from the Bay Area to stay with us and move to Meadow Vista? <laughs> and the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Why was hospitality important in Peter's day? Well, travel was dangerous during this time. Sure, inns were available in the Roman world, but they were often associated with immoral behavior. Sometimes people's travel was forced by loss of home or job or rejection of family and just fleeing for safety. Sometimes travel was also for the sake of spreading the gospel. And since it was common for churches to gather in homes during this time, it was common to have traveling evangelists whom some of these church folk had never met and to have these strangers come stay in their homes. As is written in 3 John, for they have gone out for the sake of the name accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. But hospitality, that's love of strangers who are believers, is not necessarily tied to housing and food. Hospitality includes supporting, helping, and encouraging believers in all sorts of ways. 
even going to visit them in prison, which I'm sure Paul knew something of. Hospitality is crucial in a hostile world. Hospitality is an act of love toward fellow sojourners and exiles. It reminds us this, isn't our, this place isn't our home, but we do have a home. Jesus has prepared it for us. It's with Christ. It's in his kingdom. But let's have a picture of it here today and how we love one another here and enjoy what our future rest is going to be like. I was a stranger to you once. My whole family was, but many of you showed the most wonderful hospitality toward us. You took us into your homes for several days and you fed the small town that is my family. And you did it like we were doing you a favor. And also even the home that I live in now, it's because other believers saw my need and in the blink of an eye, my stuff was just there. <laughs> I'm personally thankful to God for the faith that you have in him and how it's expressed in, you, in your love that has been shown to me and, and many others in this very way. Uh, anytime somebody new moves here, they say, yeah, I mean, the truck was there and then the stuff was gone and I had to take the truck back. It just happened. Well, may God's love continue here at FCF as it's written in Hebrews 13. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison, as though in prison with them. And those who were mistreated, since you also are in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all. And let the marriage bed be undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? How should we as Christians Live with other Christians with the end of all things at, hands, at hand. What's the game plan with one another in our final play? Well, as we've seen in the text this morning, one is be self-controlled and sober-minded for the purpose of prayer. As the hymn goes, have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. The second part of the game plan is keep loving one another since love covers a multitude of sins. In a song by Sovereign Grace called Forgiven, one verse communicates this, that point this way. Lord, forgive us for our shame. When we can't release the past, but we're quick to take the blame, but forget we're free at last. We avoid your sons and daughters for the fear we don't belong. Give us eyes to see each other through your only son. And the third part of the game plan for the last days that God gives us through the text this morning is to show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Well, why... Why? Why show hospitality to one another without grumbling? Because as the, whole, as the old hymn puts it, I love thy kingdom, Lord, the house of thine abode, the church, our blessed Redeemer saved with his own precious blood. And that's the song that we're going to sing in closing together as the music team comes forward. So let's... Pray together as the music team comes forward. God of love, we pray.
praise you for the salvation of which you, Jesus, came and sought sinners like us to save us, to reconcile us to God. You, the God-man, so graciously, our king, our prophet, our priest, we praise you for your work of being our substitute righteousness, our substitute sin bearer, even being our resurrection and raising us to a new way of life that we will know in full one day, but we know it in part today. And we pray that that love would be seen, even if it be dimly, in this church body at Foothill Christian Fellowship today. May we humbly love one another as you have loved us and show hospitality even to believers who are new to us, believers that we've yet to meet. May your love for your people be seen through us so that your name would be praised and glorified and enjoyed. Amen. Our benediction is... You can't hear me. All right, there I am. Our benediction is found in the last words of Hebrews 13. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Amen.